We are ready to kick off Leone Watson's talk. They are the director at Tetralogical, member of the W3C Board of Directors, co-chair of the W3C Web Applications Working Group, co-organizer of the Inclusive Design 24 Comp, co-author of Inclusive Design Principles, writer for Smashing Magazine, accessibility advocate, teacher, mentor, Microsoft MVP, inclusive design boundary pusher, front-end AI and web VR hacker. Give it up for Leone talking about CSS speech and a box model you have never heard of before. <laughs> I didn't do it, nobody saw me do it, you can't prove anything. Hello everybody, I am delighted to be back here at CSS Day, and I would like to talk to you about CSS Speech, uh, the CSS module you may well never have heard about. But a few things before then. If I say to you, hello, it takes me about 300 milliseconds to say that. And in those few milliseconds, you started to listen to my voice and to form an impression of who I am. Most likely that I sound like a woman and I sound British. We process audio about 100 times faster than we process visual information. And so that means by the time you'd processed all that audio information, you only then moved on to the fact that you recognize I've got palish skin, purple hair, and I'm mostly wearing black clothes. Voices, it turns out, are important. Back in 2015, a group of Harvard MBA students, these are smart students after all, were asked to record a presentation for potential recruiters. More than 160 potential recruiters were given the recordings of the presentations to watch or listen to. Some were just given the audio, some were asked to watch the video with the audio, and others were just given the text transcript of what was said. And the interesting thing is that the overwhelming majority of those 160 people found that the students whose presentations they had listened to, whether with the video or without, were more intelligent, more approachable, more friendly, and altogether more likely to be the sort of young person they would like to recruit. So it turns out, as the old saying goes, it ain't what you say, it's the way that you say it. For millions of years, our world has transformed. But something else has awakened. Okay, let's blow this conference and go to the movies, huh? Hollywood has understood this for a very long time. I mean, your reaction just as you started hearing that very first couple of words. And it's not just the words, it's that voice. Uh, the voice actor is somebody who has the splendid professional name of Red Pepper. If you're used to American movies, the person who does the very similar sounding voice is Don Fontaine. But the point is, that low, growly voice, you know what kind of movie you're going to make. It's going to be fast, it's going to be furious, it's going to be full of action, there's going to be some kicking, some punching, some yelling, and, and probably some smooching along the way too, and it's going to be great. And you've got the sense of that experience just from the sound of that voice, along with the words that they're saying. But, never mind Hollywood so much, what of our world? What of the web and technology and voices? Pretty much everything we own, we carry around in a technical technology sense has some kind of voice capability these days. Our watches, phones, laptops, desktops at home perhaps, our TVs, and I don't mean just the programming content, I mean the things themselves. Pretty much everything can talk to us and quite often we can talk back to it too. And so we have a couple of different sorts of basic architectural implementations. We've got those that do a lot of their voice processing in the cloud. So things like your home devices, Alexa, Google Home, that kind of thing, or your custom web applications, things that are built in the browser but use external APIs, things like the Google text-to-speech API or Azure from Microsoft or many more like them out there. Uh, we have on-device uh, processing. Things here uh, include web readers in browsers, um, where you can simplify the kind of the reading process, and screen readers, of course. Software that's been mentioned a couple of times already, but if you're not familiar, it's software that people like myself who are blind use to 
effectively speak the content that's on screen instead of, like most of you, I imagine, do, look at what's there. So the important part of all this is the synthetic speech part of it. This is what all these things have got in common, the bit that talks back to you. And I want to take a moment just to tell you a bit about how that's produced, because there are different forms of synthetic speech out there. It's actually quite an old technology. It's been around for a few decades in one form or another now, and it's evolved an awful lot over time, especially in the last 10 years or so. And I'm going to call on some different examples of these text speech engines to help me do this. Performance synthesis is rule based. The acoustic characters of speech are extracted from a voice recording, then programmed as rules for recreating the voice as digital audio. <laughs> so, performance synthesis is one of the oldest forms, and as you've probably just gathered, it's really basic. Uh, it's rule based, essentially, um, but very, very simplistic. Uh, its basic version of gender changes is to increase the pitch. If you've got a higher pitch voice, must be a female sounding voice. It's literally that basic and that crude. It's also got no pause, no cadence. It's like someone took a really big breath and went, right, talk, go, and don't stop until you get to the full stop. Uh, and this is a technology that a lot of screen readers still use. One of the reasons people like myself actually choose to listen to voices that sound that awful are because they're really performant. You can listen really fast using this kind of speech because it's incredibly fast to build the speech output. So you trade off a bit of voice quality against the, uh, the ability to, to speak well. But for most people listening to voice interfaces, this is just not good enough. So technology moved on. Concatenative synthesis uses a voice recording that's broken down into tiny chunks. The chunks are then reconstructed from a database to form the synthesized speech. So concatenative synthesis gave us a slightly better human quality sounding. And it's not surprising because it starts off from actual recordings of a real person. Some poor soul got stuck in a box and asked to record hours and hours and hours of their own voice. So it's not a very efficient process. It's not a good way to create a speech profile. It also, although it sounds strange, is not a particularly realistic way of producing speech because it doesn't matter how many hours of recording you get that poor person to do, it's impossible to capture every sense of emotion, every laugh, hiccup, chortle, sneeze, growl, cough, sniff, grumpy tone, happy tone, all the things that we do in speech as human beings. And so, although there is an improvement in human quality, it still sounds very stilted, very kind of artificial. Parametric synthesis uses a statistical model. The parameters of speech are extracted from a voice recording, then hidden Markov models, HMM. Modify the parameters based on the text to be spoken. So here we see one of the big accelerations in speech quality. It's sort of an odd combination of formant synthesis in the sense that it is rule-based, but what they're doing is they're taking the parameters of a speech model and applying it to different speech profiles. So it's pretty responsive, both in the speed of the speech output, but it's also quite flexible and quite useful in its ability to mimic human speech. You can probably, even now, just listening to these few examples, start to hear the improvements in quality as we've gone through these. But that brings us on to today's current version of speech synthesis. Neural TTS uses artificial neural networks trained on huge amounts of voice data. The neural networks learn the relationships between text and speech, and the result is voices that sound very close to human speech. And they really do. There are some examples out there where even someone like me who spends all day, every day, listening to synthetic speech I actually can't tell the difference a lot of the times. I think it's uh, Microsoft's Azure API has a couple of which is the real person and which isn't, and I literally can't tell the difference a lot of the time. Uh, it's astonishing, the quality that's uh, you know, available now. And it's basically like so much in the tech world at the moment, down to vast quantities of data being fed into it and training the parametric models just using hundreds of thousands, millions even, of different voices. Neural TTS can transfer the prosodic characteristics of one voice to another, making it possible to synthesize speech in the voice of a particular speaker. And this, of course, has led to voice clones. That's not actually me. That's a clone using uh, a Descript AI API. Uh, it took about 20 minutes of me recording to get that speech quality, which is terrifying in oh so many ways, um, but also really quite extraordinary. 
as a screen reader user for a long number of years, I have longed for the day where I could have Jean-Luc Picard read out my email to me. Wouldn't that be just easy? There we go. That would be awesome. Um, yes, nicking people's voices and identity theft notwithstanding, uh, the possibilities for cloning are actually phenomenal. And as part of a branding, it's going to become even more important, I think. Going back to that Hollywood idea of the voiceover, that brand of that voiceover is so entrenched, it's so clear. What if we could do the same with our voice interfaces? So let's see what capabilities we've got for designing that. We know how the speech can be produced in different ways, but what can we do with it after the fact? Well, if we think about home devices or a lot of the APIs that are available that you can port into custom web apps that are processed in the cloud, essentially, you can use a very old W3C technology called Speech Synthesis Markup Language, or SSML. I'm guessing you're all pretty familiar with HTML. So even if you've not come across SSML before, you'll get the syntax. It looks a lot like HTML. It's a standard markup language. And it's got a lot of different capabilities that are actually very similar across different types of voice interface design platforms. So you've got a voice element. Uh, this is just the bit that kind of says you're, you're going to speak and lets you choose some design elements about the way that voice will sound, uh, the choice of voice, if you like. So if I play the clip from Winnie the Pooh that's on screen at the moment with Alexa's normal voice, this is how it sounds. Piglet sidled up to Pooh from behind. Yeah, it's all very nice, quite jolly, quite pleasant. Uh, my Echo, obviously, is with me at home, so it sounds British. Uh, not too bad, but Winnie the Pooh is the story of a little boy and his friendship with his stuffed bear. So we kind of need a male voice to narrate this. And you can do this with Alexa or Google Home. And you can just use the voice and tell it, we're going to use a, a voice profile that's available um, through the Amazon APIs called Brian. And this clip will now sound like this. Piglet sidled up to Pooh from behind. Now, that's still Alexa. Doesn't sound anything like the Alexa you're probably used to listening to if you have one, but with just one element, you can change the output. And imagine if we were creating now a skill for reading uh, children bedtime stories, perhaps. We start to develop a character that's narrating the story that's very much more in tune with the content. There's a prosody element in SSML. Prosody is the general linguistic or, or, or voice term for a whole bunch of characteristics. Most obviously, volume, speed, and pitch. So we can do what humans do. We can say things a little bit louder or a little bit more quietly. We can speed them up or slow them down. Uh, we can do all these things that humans do, and we can use them to effect in our Alexa-based narration story. We can uh, cause Piglet to whisper something a little more quietly. Uh, we can speed up or raise the pitch of Piglet's voice because Piglet is small and squeaky, and so we can emulate that too. Then we have a break element because pauses are important in speech. So if you want to emphasize something, one of the best ways to do it is to build in a pause. And we can do that too with the break element. It just takes a, a number of milliseconds as, as the pause, and we can do that to great effect. We can also emphasize things. The emphasis element has different levels. You can uh, emphasize something strongly or, or less strongly, and it just enables us to put a bit more of a beat onto a word to draw people's oral attention to it. And so if we put all of these elements together, we can tell the whole story like this. Piglet sidled up to Pooh from behind. Pooh, he whispered. Yes, Piglet. Nothing, said Piglet, taking Pooh's paw. I just wanted to be sure of you. And isn't that just a little bit nicer? Um, you got the sense of the different characters and all just for a few elements that let us design something of the quality of the experience of the speech output. But what about for us on the web? Uh, this is a CSS conference, a design conference, and we are pretty much browser design production people. So what's the situation for us? Well. Not so good, it turns out. Here we come on to the CSS module. Uh, it's been around, actually, for about 20-odd years now. Uh, it's never really 
been implemented, which is the problem. More on that in a minute. Uh, it briefly made an appearance in the early 2000s as the oral style sheets. It did get implemented in a Linux screen reader called Emacs Speak. Actually, it still is implemented there to a certain degree. Uh, but it never gained much mainstream traction. Uh, those of you who work back in the days of the media types may remember that there was briefly a speech media type. Um, it then got taken out um, as CSS itself sort of evolved beyond the use of those. Um, but, and it still sits there. There is a spec. Um, it's a candidate recommendation, which it really shouldn't be according to W3C processes. That means it should have some kind of implementations, but it really doesn't. So as things stand, there are no implementations of CSS speech in any of the browsers you're used to dealing with. WebKit did very briefly support one or two of the properties, but that seems to have disappeared somewhere uh, in the past couple of years or so without anybody really noticing or knowing why. So I'm afraid I'm going to spend the rest of this talk telling you about something you almost can't go and play with. I might be able to help with that. but. I want to do this because I think there are some really damn good use cases for why we should have this on the web platform. First one is web readers. Pretty much every browser now has a web reader. Uh, Chrome was the last one to hold out, and I think they've just released one, or they're just about to. But the idea that you might want to simplify the visual interface of some content on screen because you don't need the navigation and the other clutter, and then they've introduced actual speech. So you can get most browsers now to speak the content in web reader mode to you. Tink.uk. Why we need CSS speech. Tink, Leonie Watson. Five, six minutes. In these times when almost every device and platform is capable of talking to you, you may be surprised to learn that there is no way for authors to design the oral presentation of web content in the way they can design the visual presentation. And that's the problem I think we need to solve. We've had the ability to design written content, you know, content structured with HTML for what, nearly 30 years now? Imagine a web where we didn't have that ability to design how the written content looked, was presented, the colors, the, the, the layout, the structure, the columns, all of those kind of a things. Well, that's the situation we're in now with voice output. And that seems ridiculous to me. We're missing a trick, surely. And this is where, if we had it, CSS speech could really come into its own. It starts off with stuff that looks very, very familiar. The voice family property works just like the font family, only for selecting your voices. So you can choose a sequential number of voices. If they're available on the platform someone's using, it's all good and well. And if not, it cascades onto the next one and so on down the line. This sort of works, but there's a bit of an interesting challenge, and that's there isn't really much data out there as to which voices are available on which platforms. And believe me, it's not easy because it's not relevant to a particular operating system. It's not even relative to a particular browser. If I have three or four browsers on my system, They've all got different text-to-speech voices available, every single one of them. And because I spend a lot of my time using assistive technologies like screen readers and other things that install other text-to-speech engines on my local machine, I've got even more voice profiles available to me. So with the help from uh, Stuart Language at sill at mastodon.social, if you're curious, uh, we're trying to build up as many profiles of text-to-speech availability out there. So I think on screen, there is a glitch URL there. If you've got two minutes on your device, Hurry over there, hit the big button, <laughs> and add the list of your text-to-speech profiles, your browser. It's all anonymous from the point of view of you as an individual, but help us understand. So we can actually do the equivalent of knowing which are the viable fonts, only in voice terms. Then we have the speak property. This is a lot like display. In fact, it's pretty symbiotic with display. Speak essentially determines whether the content of an element is going to get spoken or not. Uh, it can tie it to the display property itself. If you set speak to auto, the idea is that it will mirror display. So if display is none, speak will also behave as though it were set to none, and vice versa. So this is really useful. Uh, in the same way that web readers hide away the visual clutter that you don't need on the page, the speak property could be set to do the same from uh, an audio oral point of view. Then we've got prosody properties. There's a whole bunch of these, but again, they're the same characteristics, voice, speed, and volume. Sorry, 
pitch speed and volume. And we can set these using tokens, like most CSS properties have some sort of capability to do. Speed, for example, can be fast or extra fast, slow or extra slow. Um, pitch, high, very high, low, very low. It's all pretty simple, um, but it enables us to start thinking about building characters into how web readers do speak the content. And then you've got the pause properties, a bit like break in SSML, because as we said before, it's important to be able to get text-to-speech engines, web readers in this case, to pause for breath occasionally. They do generally respond to punctuation, a slight pause at a comma and a more emphatic pause at a full stop or a period, depending where you come from. Uh, but sometimes you need to make it a little bit more noticeable than that, and this is what this CSS property would let us do. And so if we were to be able to design all our content so that when the text-to-speech used by web readers in browsers came to read our particular content, our blog post, our marketing post, we could just elevate the experience using all those characteristic design tweaks to make it sound a bit more like this, perhaps. Why we need CSS speech. In these times, when almost every device and platform is capable of talking to you, you may be surprised to learn that there is no way for authors to design the oral presentation of web content in the way they can design the visual presentation. And the changes are very subtle, but it does sound a lot more engaging, a lot more energizing, kind of just a bit more natural and easier on the ear, I think. And so that's my use case one, is web readers and being able to do what we do to written content, but only to spoken content design it to suit our brand, the message we want to convey, all of those things we do design for at the end of the day. And then use case two, screen readers. Now, this is really where things get a bit more interesting. Uh, I'm a huge fan of CSS speech and what it could do for screen reader users, but not everybody agrees. And this is what leads, I think, to some of the reluctance we're hearing from browsers and implementers. News headline, nothing happened Saturday, 1 April 2023. <laughs> Absolutely nothing happened today. Everybody went and had a nice cup of tea instead. So before I interrupted myself, um, <laughs> the problem is screen readers sound like that all the time. Uh, you know, I said this is the voice I listen to, and that's the one I'm choosing to share with you. But screen readers don't have particularly good quality voices. They're not able to use the neural cloud processing quality of voices, for example. But it doesn't really matter how good the voice, everything sounds the same. Doesn't matter if you're reading about the Ukraine war. Doesn't matter if you're reading about happy kittens riding around on hoovers with shark fins on their head. Absolutely doesn't matter. It all sounds the same. There's no inflection, no cadence, no emotion, no nothing. Believe you me, it's boring. Who remembers the web of the very early 90s when everything had the same color background, blue and maroon colored links, that kind of thing? Anyone here gonna confess to knowing that? Yeah. That's what the world is like if you listen to a screen reader. It's all the bloody same. And you wouldn't want to go back, I imagine, to a world that design-wise was pretty monochromatic with some fairly ghastly link colors, any more than I really want to carry on listening to everything in exactly that same flat, disinterested tone of voice. And CSS speech, used carefully, could help us change that. So think about the M element in HTML. Uh, I believe it gives you some sort of visual styling to show that the word or the, the content inside it has some kind of emphasis. It's not recognized by screen readers. Um, it's one of those peculiar text level semantics that, that don't uh, actually convey. They don't map to an ARIA role, doesn't get exposed in the accessibility tree in the browser, so screen readers just blithely ignore it. Might as well be a span or even have no element there at all. But yet, we use it semantically speaking, as HTML, because we want to make a point. We want to emphasize something. So we could use a bit of CSS speech, for example, just to elevate that emphasis and make it available to the screen reader as they read the content. So if you really just wanted to make a point, you could just add a bit of styling and use a voice stress property on it just to, well, as the property says, stress the intonation of those words a little bit more. There's a couple of other use cases. Acronyms, uh, acronyms, acronyms and initialisms. So the difference is acronyms are the ones that we tend to speak like words. So NATO, NASA, for example. Uh, initialisms are the ones that we pronounce as specific characters, which is great. So there's a couple of examples on screen. Uh, software as a service gets pronounced by my screen reader in exactly the same way as 
SAS gets pronounced by the screen reader. So for a very long time, I couldn't work out why the technical world was hell-bent on sounding like an Anique Calamando troop of the British forces. Yeah, OK, I have more problems than this can solve, clearly, but the point remains. Uh, so we could use CSS speech to solve this problem, too. There's a speak as property that would let us determine how some sort of content was spoken. So we could say uh, speak as with the value of spell out would mean that instead of hearing sass, I would hear S-A-A-S. -A -A -S, and the world would become a lot more understandable from my point of view. But you can also do things like uh, get it to speak as digits, for example. So if you put a long string of digits, uh, most screen readers will try to read it like it's a number when in fact, of course, it might be a phone number. And because different countries around the world use different block formatting for different phone numbers, that doesn't necessarily help either. So we could say, speak this telephone number as a series of individual digits rather than a whole you know, 1,995,000 number. So it could solve tons of problems just that I hear about all the time. How do I fix this? And we kind of don't have ways to fix this stuff at the moment for screen readers. So what is the design outcome too? Well, again, same thing. Uh, better UX, because that news headline with a bit of CSS speech could sound a bit more like this. News headline, nothing happened. Saturday, the 1st of April, 2023. Absolutely nothing happened today. Everybody went and had a nice cup of tea instead. And again, it's not a huge change. It's not even really that dramatic. But as a day-to-day -day listening thing, it just makes the experience so much more engaging, so much more pleasant to have to actually deal with. So I mentioned this isn't implemented in browsers at the moment, but there is a kind of a sort of polyfill you can go and play around with. And again, I have to uh, acknowledge enormous thanks to Stuart Langridge for helping me put this one together. Uh, here's a quick demo of how some of these properties might work in practice. This sounds normal. This sounds loud. This sounds quiet. This sounds fast. This sounds slow. This sounds high. This sounds low. This specifies a voice family. <laughs> and that's it. As I say, this is not dramatic. It's not even particularly astonishing or anything. It's just gentle, subtle changes to the way speech output can work. And you can head over. Uh, you can actually play with that demo yourself. Uh, there's a kind of editable area. You can play around with the CSS and, and get it to uh, you know, sound some content. So you can get a sense of how this stuff could work in practice. Uh, I don't recommend taking this and then kind of turning it into anything production ready yet. It's likely to cause you more pain than, than success. But if you want to play around with it and get a sense of the potential, then um, you know, it's, it's there to do. I do want to say, though, we will probably need a new setting, a new operating level setting, if we want to go ahead and get this happening. And the reason comes back to the concerns that I mentioned. There's a very real worry that as a screen reader user, somebody could come along and utterly hijack my experience and stop me from being able to listen to some content in the web. I'm going to be slightly unkind here. It's happened before. We've seen it on the web in terms of visual design. We all know here, because I know the audience that typically comes to CSS Day, we get good design. We know about good color contrast and good spatial layout and comfortable text reading sizes. Lots of the rest of the world out there involved in production still don't really understand how problematic it can be when you can't read the words that someone has very thoughtfully put together on their website. So this concern isn't unprecedented, but I think there's a lot of evidence that suggests it might not be as bad as we think it could be. And the reason I think that is because of Home Assistant. We've had SSML for a very long time. They all use it. And you can hear it being used to varying degrees in, in most assistant skills, apps, and actions that you listen to. But the one thing you don't really ever find is something you can't understand. And that's because speech actually doesn't vary all that much from person to person, from language to language. Some languages might be spoken a little faster by default than others, but average speaking conversational rate is about 150 words a minute. And that doesn't vary much between cultures or people or individuals. Humans have got very sort of general tolerances for volume, for pitch and things like that. And so what we haven't really seen in any of the things that talk to us so far 
is the idea of an interface that's just so fast, so high, so quiet that it's just not understandable. And so I'm reasonably optimistic that if we got this capability in the browser, we'd very much see the same things coming true. But we have to give people a way to opt out of this. I think that's only courtesy, if not just good UX practice. So we'd need to talk to, well, as it turns out, the companies that own the browsers to get them to add uh, an operating system setting in that says, if a browser, if a website uses CSS speech, please ignore it. And there's, again, there's precedence for this. If you choose not to have animations at the, um, uh, the OS level, that's reflected through. And of course, you know, CSS now has properties that let even handle that outcome from a design point of view. If you prefer reduced animation, reduced motion, all of those kind of a things. So again, we've got precedent, but I do think this would be needed. We need a way to, to say, yeah, you know what? Don't want to listen to that. Thanks. I like the boring, grumpy screen reader. Give it back. And that's OK. Again, we can do this. We've done it before. So I need your help. Like Hida said just now, if you think getting the uh, popover attribute supported, head over to the WhatWG and, and put a thumbs up. I'd like your help trying to convince the browsers and the browser implementers that actually we do want this. We need it. There's this huge gap in the web platform right now. And voice is not going away. So if you care to spend 30 seconds heading over to the blog post on screen that I wrote and just adding your thoughts on CSS speech in the comments, and please, you know, Put negative comments. If you think this is a dreadful idea, say that too. But I just really want to put together a convincing argument that says, actually, this stuff's interesting. It's kind of cool. We could have some fun with this. We could create really amazing experiences with this. But to do that and to convince the implementers, I could really use your help. So please do take a couple of minutes and maybe head over there and add your support. Thank you. CSS, CSS, <laughs> CSS. May I guide you to our seating area? Or do you want to take questions here? Oh, I can do here, sorry, yes. Sure. Whatever's I'm easier for you, uh, um, yep. Mm -hmm. Well, there was just a spot. I don't know if the camera can, I'm sure they can't. Oh, oh do you want to wander over there? Or? That was the, what I was offering. Okay, can here I grab well. it on? Yeah. yeah, thank you. And the chair is right in front of you here. Yeah. Oh, what could possibly go wrong? This will be fine. <laughs> oh, no, it won't. I know. No, I'm going to. You sure? <laughs> this is not going to be elegant, but there we go. Uh, okay, we made it. Cool. There were a lot of questions. <laughs> oh, we almost covered this on the CSS podcast. We, uh, we read all about the oral box model. We got really excited. We're like, styling voice? That sounds so cool. And mm -hmm. then we're like, oh, support is, well, we don't, yeah. really, we don't really talk about <laughs> experimental stuff like that. Um, what a cool talk, though. Um, so many amazing demos. And the questions are off the hook. We have so <laughs> many. So I'm glad that we have some time. Um, the first one here is from Joshua Jackson on the live stream. Isn't there a new feature in iOS to let you spend a bit of time training to get your own voice that you can use with TTS? Uh, yes, there is. Nice. I've also done Descript and had it uh, make one of my own voices. Mm -hmm. And it's uncanny, but mm -hmm. kind of cool. We'll yeah. see where it goes. <laughs> Um, the next question is, uh, my own impression is that it's mostly based, like a lot of these speech developments are for Western languages. How does this tech evolve for Arabic, Chinese, or other languages? That's a good question. I'm not a speaker of, well, anything much except English. Really, really bad French. So um, I don't honestly know is, is the answer. I would imagine the same, but probably not as effectively, especially for the languages where um, you know, they're tonal based. So the, 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 the tones you use can fundamentally change the meaning of a word. Um, I suspect that CSS speech in its current form might not be subtle enough to, to work with, with some languages. But yeah, I'm a bit out of my depth linguistically there, because I don't, don't speak many other languages. Mm. Yeah, that's good. I'm, I'm assuming people can just contribute, too. So maybe we'll just have more poor, poor souls sit in boxes and speak for hours at a time <laughs> until we have multiple languages. Right. I mean, I will say there are text-to-speech languages for most widely spoken languages you know, out there. So, so in terms of being able to produce speech in, in different languages and dialects, yeah, that's absolutely possible. I think you know, Google has 170 odd different voices. Microsoft has 144. Um, even down to you know, national dialects, there are some text-to-speech engines that will, will speak in a Liverpudlian accent for you know, people who come from, from the Liverpool city area of, of the UK, for example. 
there are so many people well, also just on that i couldn't help but thinking that like there could be a google fonts for google speech voices mm -hmm. we're just sort of like bringing them in and and then providing that font family but it's a speech family and that right. just sounded so rad mm -hmm. um so many people want to know your favorite voice to listen to <laughs> um oh that's actually really hard there is um so the, the really lousy one I've been playing in, in these things, actually, in some respects, is my favorite because it, it's been the voice of my screen reader for 20 odd years. Um, and, and so it's sort of familiar. So I, so I like it in that sense of it's like a comfortable pair of jeans you can just you know, step into and, and you're right at home. Uh, there is uh, another not very good quality one, but better than that, called uh, Ava, which is part of the vocalizer, expressive voices. And it's just a female American voice. but like a news reader kind of sounds quite confident and quite clear so yeah that's not a bad not a bad voice i love that a voice can be like a pair of pajamas <laughs> i love it um the second kind of follow-up question is when you're increasing the rate of speed what's your favorite voice or what's the relationship between choosing a voice and the rate of speed that you're willing to listen to in the moment uh so again that that sort of Formant example I've been playing, and I mentioned conversational speech is about 150 words a minute. I typically listen at about 550 words a minute, something like that. It's it's not something I just suddenly woke up one day and went, hey, I'm going to turn this up and do it. You, you do it a little bit at a time, and it's kind of like skim reading. You know, as you're moving around your, your device, your computer, you don't stop and read every menu item. You don't stop and read every word on a web page. You just kind of use visual cues to sort of skim through it, and, and there's a big sense of that. You know, I'll listen to the first couple of syllables of, of a menu item as I'm navigating, and that's enough to tell me it's it's what I want or not. So you just sort of build up that experience over a number of years. But uh, because I like listening at that speed, yeah, the lower quality voices are better because they're punchier and, and they're more articulate. Um, some of the better quality voices, once you start speeding them up. It's a bit like asking a human to start speeding up. They start mumbling. You can't really hear it. And it's all a bit like this. And, and that's not going to get your, your work done at the end of the day. So, you know. That sounds like a fun way to troll someone. You offer a voice that's just mumble, mumble jumble, and then you yeah. select it and be like, I don't know. It just sounded like a fun choice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we have a follow-up question, too, uh, which is, how does this compare to ARIA? Or is CSS speech just for content and not the controls of your web app? Uh, no, it is just, just all about the content, so yeah, it wouldn't change ARIA at all. Um, ARIA is the thing that you know, tells me something's a button. Uh, CSS speech is the bit that would tell me or, or would decide whether my screen reader shouted the label of the button <laughs> or whispered it to me or, or you know, did it in a different voice, for example. I liked that you mentioned um, the speed can become... Um, you get a hint. So there's a thing in building UI and UX that I like to think about providing hints to people, mm -hmm. or I even love the phrase like you provide the scent of something mm -hmm. so they can smell it's coming, even though you can't smell my website. Um, the scent oral yeah. model or the scent box model, that'd be funny. Um, <laughs> but I like that you're like the speed can be raised up and that you can get a hint at the content and then escape mm -hmm. uh, quickly. And that just sounds like how, how could I provide more hints mm -hmm. and the scent of the content so that you can bail early and stuff like that? Or do you have any advice there for UX about providing mm. better hints in this way? I think so. I mean, you know, providing hints is an interesting one because they're useful right up until the point where you don't need them anymore and then they're a hindrance. But Sounds like animation. <laughs> but yes, you're right. If we could, uh, you know, I remember back when tab panels first started getting used and it caused a lot of confusion especially for screen reader users who didn't have the visual cues to, to know how to, to try and guess what the interaction might be. And there was a lot of talk about how do we provide hints then. And yes, if you could have done those in a sort of slightly higher pitch, different voice, so people get used to the idea that when they hear that tone of voice or that voice choice, it's a bit of helpful information coming their way. It's kind of the equivalent of the question mark you know, icon. It's, it's a, a different way of, of alerting people to the fact this is helpful information. Awesome. Uh, we have a question here from Robert. It says, would it be wise to have default CSS properties like display and font family to inherit default properties from voice family and speak? Uh, yeah, well, as I say, speak and display already, or I say already do, should, if we ever got an implementation, um, behave exactly like that. They should work very, very closely together. Uh, could we do it for voice family and font family? Mm. Possibly. I guess there would have to be some kind of mapping that where, you know, if you chose your your two or three different fonts, they could maybe be mapped to certain widely available voices. 
Yeah, it's an interesting idea. Interesting thought mm. indeed. Um, Stephen Hay, who I don't know who that is, weirdo. <laughs> um, just kidding. Um, can you explain why CSS speech hasn't been implemented? Are there clear reasons? Not very clear, but the clearest I think is is the concerns that have been raised by screen reader users over the years seem to have sort of lodged in the minds of, of browser teams and implementers. Um, and, and that seems to have been the, the, the kind of stumbling block, or still seems to be the stumbling block, is that they're not unreasonably very worried that, that this would make things worse for an awful lot of people. Um, but I don't think there's been any really concerted effort to find out actually if that's still how people feel, or indeed, if it's how very many people feel, screen reader users feel. And certainly that blog post has comments from quite a few screen reader users now going, yeah, bring it on. So um, yeah, I, I think that's, that's really the biggest reason is, is that they don't want to be seen to be causing more problems than this would solve. And that's, that's, that's a good position to be in as a rule. And, and you know, it's good to be cautious, but I just like to kind of encourage them out of that a little bit now. <laughs> Yeah, I loved that you brought up readers. Google did finally ship their reader. I, I know the PM, and I'm like, I'm going to go ask them how to put in a voice reader. <laughs> like, might as well. You've <laughs> spent all this other work to make accessible mm -hmm. content. You know, go the next level. Yep. Um, there was a follow-up question, which you briefly tapped on there, which is kind of like around the idea of with great power comes great responsibility. And this <laughs> question is, uh, when it comes to speech and CSS, I can imagine that there would be cases where it would do more harm than good by people trying to be creative instead of helping. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't there also be a possibility for the user to disable CSS speech preference when that happens, such as mo motion, which I think you talked a little bit. Yeah, your, absolutely. Your mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we would need an, an operating level system setting, just like we have for animation, to say, yep, no thanks. Um, and then for that to be respected by, by the browsers. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's almost like you could have a forced colors, you could have a forced voice. Right, yeah. You know, it's just mm -hmm. I, I bring my voice to the table. You su suggested them. That's mm -hmm. very cute. Uh, I don't want it. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, most accessibility properties uh, are HTML properties. Would it not make sense to do the same for speech or use a different type like cascading audio sheets? Oh, they just made that up. That's great. <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, this is uh, oral style sheets is what CSS speech started off as. Um, but no, I don't think so. I, actually, this came up in Hida's talk just now. I'm not a great fan of the, the steps the CSS has taken towards re-blurring the lines that we very carefully separated back in the day between kind of structure and content and, and design. I, and so for me, at least, this is not about the structure of the content. It's not about the content itself. It's just how we design, how it sounds. And, and so I think I, my personal preference would be to keep it in the design space, um, not in the semantic space, because yeah, the two, two are, for me at least, not the same thing at all. You did, I, I loved the mental model and visual that you shared with us, like um, old web being white paged, black text, blue mm -hmm. links, and that how unexciting and um, undesigned that was. And right. while it might have been a structural document that we could all consume, it was mm -hmm. lacking charm and weirdness, which we're going to hear about later. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, why not the same for audio? Um, it yeah. makes a lot of sense for that to be a sort of uh, a request. Right? Again, styles are always this suggestion. There's a compromise that we're making with the user and our own preferences. And I, d I think it is going to land well in CSS as well. We have a question here about uh, large language models. Um, maybe having a polyfill in the browser with web GPU running and doing all this stuff on the fly? Uh, yes. Yeah, I, there was no reason why you couldn't. Um, um, I, I, I wonder what the performance would be like, but um, yes, if somebody has skills in that area. Go nuts. Go, go, go have at it. <laughs> I'll give it a shot. Sounds cool. Um, <laughs> do you know good free web readers that use neural AI voices? I use web readers for my dyslexia. Uh, so I think most of the ones that have speech capability, actually, no, they don't. They're on device for the most part. Uh, no, actually, I can't think of one that does. Most of them use parametric voices, so the next, next sort of evolutionary step backwards by a little bit. Um, doesn't mean to say there aren't any, but I'm not aware of them. Um, mostly because web readers for, for kind of dyslexia and, and other things like that um, aren't an area I know much about because obviously I use a screen reader, which sort of does the same thing um, by accident, if you like. So no, sorry, whoever asked that, I don't really know. No worries. Are there UI patterns available for speech, or have you found any um, any patterns or things developing as you've read the spec or worked on the spec, things that you can make suggestions? Not patterns in the sense that come from the spec, but like so much of actually what we started 
you know, putting together on the web. A lot of it comes from the analog world. Um, you know, I think we ended up with buttons and radio buttons and, and all of those things that, that came from, from hardware in life before that. I think with speech, we've got the same thing that we can look to, you know, uh, TV radio, for example, you know, in the, um, the fake news story there, I used a slightly higher, quicker pitch voice for the uh, date, I think, because it's a slightly less important thing. You get this with the terms and conditions in radio adverts all the time, you know, that last health warning, like, this is actually going to kill you, but we're going to say it really fast and hope you don't notice and you won't remember if you do. Um, so <laughs> it's not a good one, perhaps, but I think, you know, we'll, we'll see patterns from, from other kind of media, if you like, that, that will teach us, you know, good things. Um, and if anything, you know, look to acting, voiceovers as in the, uh, you know, the, the, the movie sense of it and how they script and, and very carefully kind of sculpt and decide when pauses come and speed and things like that get changed. Very cool. I love the idea of finding design inspiration from the ways that delivered speech is happening so well today. Uh, what a cool idea there. Uh, we have someone asking, how are emojis handled by TTS technology, and how can we make that UX good for screen readers? Sorry, how is? Um, emojis. So emojis, oh, emojis. and uh, text-to-speech. Uh, yeah. oh, well, emojis in the general sense actually work really well now. They didn't for a long time. Um, but now uh, the latest generations as they get released take a bit of time to catch up, but most of the commoner garden ones now are, are just read by screen readers. Interestingly, a little bit differently on various platforms. So. You've got to be a bit careful about. <laughs> yeah. I forget. There's a good example now. One is just comes out like it's a fairly standard smiley face on iOS or something, and on Android, it, it its meaning kind of comes across as smirk or something, which you could take to mean a kind of half smile or a sarcastic smirk, and it's a bit more indeterminate. But but they work really well. So yeah, we could use TSS speech perhaps to to do that. So we could have you know smiley faces or happier emoji kind of you know spoken in a happier, more joyful voice or something like that. And yeah, uh, warning ones maybe spoken a little bit more loudly and clearly perhaps, or yeah, there's tons of possibilities. I feel inspired to uh, write some sort of small paragraph that I can say really fast at the end of this. And you know, like, uh, just like you're saying on the radio mm -hmm. and just warn everybody of something. I don't know what I'd warn them about. It just <laughs> sounds like really fun. But my question is, do you have uh, friends that can emulate a fast talk to just be silly? You know, you're just hanging out, having a drink, and someone starts to be really fast, and you're just like, hey, I still caught all that fool. Yeah. Like, you can't fool me. <laughs> I don't get that so much, but actually on the occasions when I go to a conference and there's a lot of other screen reader users listening to their phones, it's really peculiar, because you get used to thinking, me using my phone is, is private because nobody around me is likely to be able to understand it, and then you go to a conference and you suddenly realize, actually, everybody around me can understand my phone. So, yeah, it's... Uh, I love it. Well, that is all the questions that we're able to take. You can find Hida and Leone in the help desk area, uh, and they can answer more of your questions. You can also talk to the DevTools and browser engineers upstairs, the Google help, help Desk. They're hungry for your feedback and really want to deliver product excellence. We're going to have a lunch break until 13.55 or 1.55. The buffet is upstairs, and there's plenty for everyone, so you don't have to rush. There's stairs in the front, right over here. As well, look, it says, point to your left. Hey, that was really good uh, direction. Uh, thank you. It's like I feel like Zoolander, you know, like everyone. I could, anyway, whatever. <laughs> um, please do not take your cups and plates into the auditorium. They're going to fall over and make a mess, as well as some noise, and have some fun and talk about CSS with your nerdy homies. See you around. <laughs>